One Sunday morning, a man wouldn't get out of bed. I mean, he, the father of his family, husband to his wife, he normally was the first one out of bed every Sunday morning. He was the one normally uh, trying to get everyone else to hurry up, let's get ready, let's get to church on time. But this Sunday morning, though, he stayed in bed. And finally, his wife went into the bedroom and said, it's time to get up. I mean, we've got to leave in just a few minutes. We've got to get to church And he started griping and grumbling and complaining and offering excuse after excuse as to why he didn't want to go to church that morning. I mean, he said things like, nobody there appreciates me. He said, everybody there gripes about me. He said, half the people that come to that church are hypocrites. And the other half don't even speak to me. And he just went on and on and he griped and complained about the church. And and finally he said, I can't think of one good reason I should get up and go to church today. And his wife said, I can. You're the preacher. (laughs) I know some of you might can relate to that with your own jobs. Maybe there are a few days you wake up uh, and you just, uh, you don't want to get out of bed. You don't want to go to work. I'll tell you someone else, though, in the church that can relate to that. I think that people in the church who are Bible school teachers can maybe relate somewhat to that particular story. Because after all, we ask ourselves sometimes, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep teaching? And you know the process that you go through. You know how much time you put into it. You spend countless hours making preparation. You study your Bible, you pray for wisdom as you study, and you pray for the right words as you teach uh, the members of that class. And then you get up on Sunday morning, sometimes maybe against your better judgment, and you go on to Bible school and you teach that class. And then you say, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep doing this when half the class looks disinterested? Why do I keep doing this when I ask a question and it's as silent as the tomb? Nobody will answer. Why do I keep doing this when sometimes when I'm talking, others are talking, whispering, maybe even laughing? Why do I keep doing this when there are about as half many empty seats as there are full seats because some just choose not to come? Why do I teach? Why do I keep on teaching? teaching. Well, if you're a teacher and you've asked that question, and I know you probably have, I have some answers for you today. I want to tell you why it is that we who teach the Bible keep on teaching. There's a lesson to some extent in this introduction that you must persevere when you're a teacher. But but that question though, why do I keep on doing this? Why do I keep on teaching. I want to give you some reasons today why you keep on doing that. And this lesson really has two purposes. Number one, it's to encourage those who teach. You saw all those people that stood up just a little bit ago. So many people in this congregation for so many years have continued to teach, many on a weekly basis, never taking a break. Why is it that you do that? And the reasons I'll give today, I hope, will encourage you, perhaps even inspire you to want to keep on doing that. And then the other purpose of this lesson is to remind all of us who sit in classes and hear those teachers teach those lessons, to remind all of us how much we should appreciate that. For, for us to realize how much time goes into that, how, how, the, the purpose of why this is being done, so that we will show that great appreciation for those who teach us the Bible. So if you've ever asked that question, why do I teach? Here are some reasons. Here's the first reason you teach. You teach because Jesus was a teacher. You teach because you realize that Jesus was a teacher. Jesus was called a lot of things in his lifetime here on earth. But one of the things he was called most appropriately was teacher or rabbi. About 60 times you'll read about him being addressed as teacher or rabbi in the New Testament. It was was a very appropriate name for him. He was recognized as a teacher. I tell you, even those who were against him, even his enemies... When they would come to him, sometimes wanting to trap him in his own words, they would address him as rabbi, or they would call him teacher. There's an example of that in Matthew chapter 22, in verse 24. These people, even the enemies of Jesus, believed, in fact, that he was a teacher. 
Scripture even describes how he was a great authoritative teacher. You might recall, if you've read the Sermon on the Mount recently, or maybe you just remember these words sticking out there at the end of that sermon. It is recorded by Matthew in Matthew chapter 7, 28 and 29, that when Jesus finished that sermon, when he finished these teachings, it says the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he teached as one having authority and not as the scribes. He was recognized as a teacher among the people. And after his greatest sermon, and I would remind you, this was a sermon when the, he got done, the people said, he's a teacher. The reason you keep on teaching, first and foremost, is because you recognize that Jesus was a teacher. Here's another reason we continue to teach. We teach because we believe we owe a debt. All of us who teach believe that we owe something because of what's been done for us in the past. Listen to what Paul said about this. He said, owe no man anything. Now you may recall, what does that have to do with teaching? That's something that's said in Romans chapter 13 and verse 8. But he said, owe no one anything. One translation uh, says, let no debt remain outstanding. And that's just a reminder, I think, for Christians that we ought to pay our bills. But it applies to teaching in the sense of we should be indebted to those who came before us who taught us. And I think Paul realized that. Paul was one of the great teachers in the New Testament. And listen to what he said about this in Romans chapter 1, 14 and 15. He said, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are at Rome. One translation, he says, I am a debtor to do this. You're a debtor to do what, Paul? I am a debtor to preach the gospel. And I think it, the same applies to teaching. If we have been taught in the past, we realize that we have a debt to, to continue to teach, to teach others so we can repay the debt. You realize that as a redeemed son of God, you've been bought back. You've been purchased. As Paul said, we were bought with a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so if you've been bought with a price, what does Paul say you need to do? He says, so glorify God in your body. One of the ways we can glorify God and one of the ways we can pay back the debt is to teach. Because we've been taught the most important, precious thing that anyone could ever hope to learn. And that is we've been taught about a God who redeems us and buys us back out of our sin. And so, realizing we've been bought, realizing it's important to glorify God in our body, one of the ways we do that is with our lips we teach and with our body we serve and we give an example. And so, why do we teach? We do that because we owe a debt. Here's another reason that we teach. We teach because we believe every generation has to be taught. We had a, a series about generations here in the fall of last year, and we wanted to, to inform you, in case you've missed it, that there are numerous generations that meet under this roof every Sunday morning as we come together to go to Bible class and as we worship God together. There are four mature generations that meet right here under this roof, even as we're worshiping God this morning. And if you want to then add the fifth generation, the newest generation that is coming on, uh, really, counting our children, our smallest children, we have five generations that meet in this place every Sunday. And that would be true for almost every congregation of God's people. So we recognize as we come together as we blend these generations together, that it's important to remember that just because one generation knows it, it doesn't mean that the next generation knows it. And if the oldest couple of generation knows God's will, that does not mean that the newest couple of generations know God's will. And so what do we have to do? We have to continue to teach generation after generation. Paul told Timothy, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I don't know if you've ever broke that verse down, but really there are four parts of that verse. Number one, there is Paul who taught Timothy. 
And then number two, there's Timothy. Paul said, you need to teach faithful men. And then he said, when you teach faithful men, they'll teach others also. You see how this must keep on happening. Generation after generation. One teacher teaches another teacher to be a teacher who's going to teach someone else on down the way. And, <clears throat> and you know who could appreciate this probably the best in the New Testament? The one that Paul was talking to. Timothy really understood this principle. We know that he was a third generation Christian because it says in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5 that he had a grandmother uh, whose name was Lois and he had a mother whose name was Eunice and Paul said you've got a sincere genuine faith I know that you've got a sincere genuine faith and he linked it back to them and so when when Paul said you know Timothy you, you what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses you entrust a faithful man that they'll be able to teach others also Timothy probably thought I get that I'm a product of that. I understand that. Now, it's the primary purpose of the home to first teach children. I, I think we understand that. We should understand that. We should recognize that. The great principle of the Old Testament, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. From Deuteronomy chapter 6, that was entrusted to the parents and to the grandparents, to the families of those days. And it says specifically there in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And, and the writer goes on to describe how you do this as you live out your lives. You, live, you do this as you talk to them uh, when you sit in your house or when you walk by the way or when you go down or when you rise up. In other words, Here's how you teach your children. You, you do it as you live your life. You do it as you go about your everyday activities. He says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. But do we ever consider that not all families do that? Not all families do that. Not all families, even in the church, do a good job with that. And so that is why we as a church of God's people understand that if the church or that the home is not teaching children, if the home is not modeling Christianity, then we in the church have got to do that. And so we pick up the slack. That's one of the reasons we teach. Every generation needs to be taught the whole truth all over again. It, it sounds really intimidating when you put it like that. But every generation has to be taught the whole truth all over again. And so when someone says, well, preacher, why do you sometimes preach on what seems to be first principles? It's because you may know it, but there's another generation coming up that doesn't know it. As a matter of fact, take time to turn over with me to Hebrews, the fifth chapter. One passage I want us to stop and read together this morning for sure, because I think it illustrates, the, number one, the importance of teaching, and it illustrates the importance of what we're talking about here, that every generation has got to be taught the whole truth all over again. Let's start in Hebrews chapter 5 uh, at verse 12, where it says, For though by this time... You ought to be teachers. So Paul is writing to Christian people who ought to be mature, ought to be to the point in their uh, maturation in Christ that they would be able to teach other people. He says, for though by at this time you ought to be teachers, he said, here's the problem. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and you who have come to need milk and not solid food. He goes on to say, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, or of full age. That is, that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to do, discern both good and evil. Now don't just stop there because it's the end of the chapter. Keep reading. He says, Therefore, based on these things, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, or to maturity, in other words. Not laying again the foundation of, and then notice some of the things he says here. Not laying again the foundation of, of repentance 
from dead works and of faith toward God or of the doctrine of baptisms or of laying on of hands or of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. He starts listing some things that he calls elementary principles that I think is very interesting. He talks about faith, repentance, and baptism. Some of the most elementary things a person who is young, who doesn't know, needs to learn so that they'll be able to become a child of God. Now, see, the problem here in this particular setting is there were people who were of a mature age, physically, we might say, who had apparently been Christians for quite a while, a a number of years perhaps, and yet the writer is saying to them, you haven't matured like you should have. You haven't grown up in Christ like you've grown up in years You should know these things. And as a matter of fact, some of you ought to now be at the point where you can teach. But the problem is, you need somebody to come back and teach you again the first principles. Now that was a problem for them, but it's a reminder for us that we have to continue to teach every generation the first principles. Because every generation has to be taught the truth all over again. That's one of the reasons we continue to teach. We continue to teach also because we realize it builds us up and it corrects error. It does this all at the same time. It's amazing how dynamic teaching can really be. Uh, We know that the Word of God is the power of God to salvation, and so that's dynamic literally in and of itself. But Listen to what Paul told Timothy. He said this in regards to preaching, but it applies to teaching as well. We should understand. He said, preach the word or teach the word. Preach the word or teach the word. Why? Be ready in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. A couple of things happen when we teach and when we preach. One of the things we do is we build up. We build people up with the word. We exhort people. We, we, we are constantly trying to build Christians up. And the way we do that is we teach. Listen to what Paul said about this. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. It says that God gave us teachers to equip the saints for the, the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. God gave us teachers to build up the body of Christ. And the way that this happens is through the word of his grace, according to Acts chapter 22 and verse 32. The word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So when we teach, we are building up, but at the same time, we are reproving or we're correcting error. Jesus taught that a failure to know the scripture will cause religious error in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29 he answered them and said you are wrong because you don't know the scriptures that's pretty interesting he says you're wrong because you don't know the scripture nor the power of God the, the word translated wrong there is also translated mistaken and it, it means to wander or to stray or to roam When people aren't taught the Word of God, they start to wander and stray. They get mistaken. Or or they are flat out wrong. And there's there's only one thing to do to correct that. If If this happens because you're not taught the Word of God, the way you correct that is you teach people the Word of God. That's what teachers do. Teachers teach people the Word of God. And therefore, in doing so, They build up the faithful and they correct those who are wondering and who are mistaken and who are wrong. And all of that can happen in the same context where the scripture is being taught as we do so on a regular basis. The reason this happens is because there is truth in teaching. We teach the truth. We can know the truth and the Bible says the truth will set us free. Uh, Even from the the bondage of being in error and being wrong and being mistaken, when we learn the truth, when, when we teach the truth, it, it allows people to know it and it, it can, they can be set free from that bondage. We teach the truth because that's what Jesus wants us to do. He says, sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. He wants us to teach the truth. And then here's one other reason to answer that question. Why? we teach 
I would say that we teach also to save others and to save ourselves. We teach to save others and to save ourselves. The bottom line of teaching is we want people to be saved. And there, there's only one place that we can direct people's attention to be saved, and that is to Jesus. He is the only hope of finding what this world is really searching for. You recall on one occasion in John chapter 6, it says that many of the disciples at that point turned and walked away. They no longer walked with Jesus. And so he turned to the 12, the 12 apostles, and he said, um, will you also go away? And sometimes Simon Peter didn't always have the right answer, but he spoke up on this occasion, and he said the right thing when he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Teaching directs people to Jesus, and Jesus is the one who has all the answers. There are people wandering around in this world. Sometimes people wander aimlessly, even as God's people, in and out of faithfulness and involvement in the church. And we need to stop and remind people, where else can you go but to the Lord? He is the one who has all the answers. He is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And the way all that happens is through the teaching of the Word. That's how fundamental and basic yet important this really is. It is through the teaching and then the reception of the hearer of the Word that our souls are saved. James said it this way in James 1 verse 21. He said, we should receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. God works through his Holy Spirit and through the word of God to save people from their sins through the teaching of his word. And that is why we teach. And oh yeah, not only as we teach do we save others, but we save ourselves. And if you're looking for a really good reason to be involved in teaching, it will help you do what you need to do to be saved. Again, listen to what Paul said to Timothy regarding this. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16, he says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will both save yourselves, yourself and your hearers. So there's the principle. Why don't we teach? to save others, but also to save ourselves. The bottom line in our teaching and in our preaching is we want people to develop faith in God. It's the bottom line. Because it is through faith that we're pleasing to God. Or Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says that just a slightly different way without faith it's impossible to please God so that means it's with faith that we please God and faith is the fundamental building block to a right relationship with God and it all begins with the teaching of the word so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God we could add a little addendum there to just say the faith that is taught comes by hearing it's, it's kind of inferred in the verse so faith comes by hearing it has to be taught and hearing by the word of God I hope that you're a person of faith today it's so important that you have faith so that you can please your God it may be that you're not a Christian today your very faith is the building block to what you need to do next Jesus himself said he who believes and is baptized will be saved and if you have never been baptized. If you've never become a Christian, today we want to give you the opportunity to respond. We're going to sing a song here in just a moment. As we sing this song, it's designed to encourage those who might need to respond to the lesson in some kind of way. And if you need to be baptized to become a Christian today, we want to give you that opportunity. If you struggled in your Christian life and you need prayers, maybe you need counseling from shepherds. There are a couple of shepherds that will be back toward our library, and you're welcome to go back to the back and meet them as we sing this song of encouragement together.
Maybe we should have had a teacher sign up day <laughs> as a way to respond to this lesson. Uh, but we want you to know how important teaching is. That's why we've preached about it today. And that's why we want to encourage our teachers to keep on teaching and to have others to desire to want to do that as well. We're about to sing this song. We want to encourage you, if you need to make changes in your life, to, re- to use this opportunity to respond. Do it right now as we stand and as we sing.